Precious indeed. Well, that's good. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Philemon. A little short book in the New Testament, only had one chapter, got 25 verses. The book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, verse number one. Philemon, verse number one. The Apostle Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus and our fellow soldier and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such in one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Father, bless this holy book now. Give me wisdom in the scripture. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Philemon, you know it's the story of a runaway slave. And if you'll notice the slave's name in verse number 10 is Onesimus. And the letter is addressed to the owner of that slave, Philemon. And the question has been posed many times, why does the Bible support slavery? And of course, I have to answer that tonight. If you'll please listen to me, I'll try to give you a good explanation. The Bible is a history book, and it records the warfare of a nation that lived in a violent time and a violent era. Their people were carried off in captivity into slavery, Israel, and Israel, by virtue of winning wars, would take people slave into slavery. This is the Old Testament uh, pattern. This is the way it worked in the Old Testament. Of course, that's still happening today around the world. Slavery by no means is over. There's a lot of slavery going on in the world, especially in the Arab communities. But the bottom line is that Israel in the Old Testament was like their pagan counterparts when it came to conquering and being conquered. And if you have read some of the stories in the Old Testament, for example, you know the story of... Uh, of uh, of the Syrian, the rich Syrian who had leprosy. What was his name? Naaman the leprid. Well, then his household was a little maiden from Israel, and she had been taken captive. She was a slave, and she had been, uh, she had been planted there by the grace of God because God's grace used her to show, uh, to show healing to Naaman because she told him about a prophet in Israel who would be able to see to it that he was healed. God uses the bad things for good. Now that's the Old Testament, but I come to the New Testament with you tonight because we need to understand that there is a vast difference between the Old Testament economy and the New. There is not one word of Scripture, if you can find it, show it to me, from the book of Matthew through the book of Revelation that ever commands anybody to make a slave out of anybody in the New Testament. Think long and hard on that. Think about that. The next time some professor at UT throws it up in your face and tells you that the Bible is a slave book, and that it's out of date, and we don't need that for today, remind him that the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the blood atonement, the blood that was shed at Calvary, is for a red man, yellow man, black man, white man. That the foot of the cross is level, and there is not one word in the New Testament that commands, now remember the wording, commands you to make a slave of anybody. The only slavery we find in the New Testament is a man's a slave to sin. 
And the Bible says that he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. The word servant is from the Greek word doulos, which literally means a slave. He's bound and in slavery to his master, and his master is sin. The New Testament, therefore, is a book of grace. It's a book of freedom. It's a book of mercy. It's a book that makes people free. It's a book that washes them in the blood of Jesus Christ, regardless of who they are. The Bible said in Hebrews, by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. The New Testament is a book that I can preach to anybody, anywhere, at any time. It doesn't make any difference who they are. I, it, I don't bother myself with what color a man is. When I open the Bible, I preach it to him. It's not the color of your skin that's the issue with God. The issue is the fact that you're a sinner. What's in your heart, that's the issue. And that's where God Almighty's contention with all mankind. So the New Testament, one more time, there's not one place, and I haven't been able to find it, if you can show it to me, there's not one place in the New Testament that commands anybody to make a slave out of another human being. Just the opposite. As you begin to read it, you'll find that there's grace and mercy been extended to you. You'll find that God's been long-suffering to you as I preached to you this morning. I talked about the graciousness and goodness of God and how that God through His long-suffering and His goodness has led you to repentance. And that's a wonderful thing because that's what you tell other people about. You can tell them your testimony and tell them what God's done for you. And you can live it in front of them and show them by your life that your words are backed up by the way you live. That's very important. Don't ever let your Baptist religion get between you and God. Amen. Don't ever let your Catholic religion get between you and God. Don't ever let your Methodist religion get between you and God. I'm not impressed with any man's church, but I am impressed with the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm greatly impressed with him. He blows my mind every time I begin to think about his goodness, his greatness, and how marvelous and wonderful that he is. And the fact of the matter is, he's the most, he is the most indiscriminate that ever has lived when it comes to who can come to him. For if whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. I'm so glad whosoever includes me. I'm glad for that tonight. Not a rich man or a poor man, not, a, not, not the elite or whatever. It doesn't make any difference who you are. The cross at Calvary is open to all of Adam's race. And the reason for that is because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It teaches us in the book of Romans. And for as whereby as my one man's sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned, every last one of us. So it's not the color of my skin that's the issue, it's the content of my heart that is the issue. And I must be born again, just like everybody else. So slavery is a horrendous thing. It's the kind of thing that you can grow to hate. Slavery is the kind of thing that, de that de demeans humanity. Slavery is the kind of thing that not only puts in bondage the one in slavery, but it puts in bondage the one who makes the slave out of him. Slavery is a horrible thing. It's a blight on humanity. Amen. Amen. To this very day, they go into countries like Russia and, and the Middle East over there. They offer women, uh, they offer them, they offer them uh, transport into a new country, jobs and what have you. But what they're doing is taking those women and they're selling them into sex slavery. They're taking children and they're doing the same thing with them. This is happening everywhere. All you have to do is a little research on the internet and you'll find out the FBI and some of the other law enforcement agencies in this country are working 24 seven to try to catch up with all these murderous devils that are enslaving women and other people and they're doing it for money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The, the, sex, the, the slave trade folks was a very lucrative business. When you went to Africa, loaded up these slave ships, which were huge, as a matter of fact. Some of them were three and four decks high, deep. And they would stack these men in there like cordwood. And they would put them in there and make the sail across the Atlantic. And by the time they got to their destination, many of them were already dead. And of course, when they died aboard ship, they just tossed their body overboard and, and, and to, into the ocean. And so it was a very lucrative thing, though because the, the manual labor was always in demand. And back in those days, if you plowed a field, you needed somebody to do the plowing. And if you planted cotton, if you planted rice, if you did these things, you needed somebody to do that job. And for example, where they're going to Haiti right now, they're carrying the gospel down there to the Haitians. Do you know who populated Haiti? 
Do you know that it's all a matter of the slave trade? You realize that that was nothing in the world more than a European colony where they planted, where they, where they put, moved those people in there on plantations in Haiti and they worked them to death so they could make all the money they could off of them. That's why the black folks are down there in Haiti because of the slave trade. Not just there, throughout the Caribbean, throughout many parts of the country and the world. Did you know that at one time in this country, when the United States of America rose up against Great Britain in 1776 and rebelled against the English crown, that a lot of black people in America fought with the British because the British offered them the possibility of freedom from the American slavery. And of course, I don't blame them, do you? If a man's got you locked up in chains and taken your family away from you, taken your livelihood away, away from you, and this was an appealing thing to the, to, uh, to the black folks for the British. And so that was also part of that. But I'm going to get you a little bit of history tonight and show you the hand of God and the hand of Christ in the issue of making slaves and setting slaves free. God Almighty will make a man free, and if the Son make you free, you're free indeed. Amen. Say it again. If the Son make you free, you're free indeed. Amen. Amen. Men and governments take your freedoms away, but God gives them to you. These are innate to us. These are, these are inalienable rights. These are the kind of things that, that come to us by the hand of God. And this is why they wrote that preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And they said that because they understood that it's not the government's place to give a man freedom and make him free. That's God's place. That's God's place. It's the government's place to do the best job it can possibly do to govern humanity that's underneath its power and control. So let's go back to Great Britain, back in the 1700s, to a little man by the name of William Wilberforce. How many's ever heard of him? William Wilberforce was a member of the British Parliament. We're talking about the 1700s. For 20 long years after he got saved, he got saved by the grace of God. And when he got saved, his life changed. And Wilberforce set about from that day to see what he could do to right many of the wrongs. He got with some people in Great Britain who were abolitionist back in the 1700s. They wanted to do away with slavery. And so for 20 long years, William Wilberforce worked to end the slave trade. Slavery comes in two flavors. There's the slave trade, then there's the actual ownership of slaves on the plantations and places like that. It is the slave trade that is so lucrative. Because you take a ship over to Africa or some other place, you load it up with slaves, carry it back, and go to the slave market and sell them on the, on the, on the market block, and you're going to make a pile of money. And so this was, this was an incentive for these people to go back and forth, back and forth. But remember, they had to go through the ocean. They had to, carry, they had to go through the waters. They needed ships. Uh, that's the only way to get from continent to continent before they had a, airplanes. And so they, 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 would carry, they would carry the slaves in their ships. So for 20 years, William Wilberforce, once he got saved, had set about to do everything he could to end the slave trade. And in 1807, remember this date, in 1807, Great Britain passed the, 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 the Anti-Slave Trade Act. I forget the official name of it, but it simply had to do with the fact that Great Britain would no longer uh, participate in the, in, the, in the transport of slaves from Africa, uh, West Africa, uh, mostly in that, in, that, in that era, and it would no longer be part of the slave trade in 1807. And 1807, Great Britain had the largest navy in the world. For 100 years from 1807 till the early 1900s, Britannia ruled the waves. Great Britain was such a small island, yet it projected its strength all over the world. And one of the great reasons that it projected its strength all over the world was the fact that it had a navy. Great Britain had the greatest, largest, and best navy on the face of the earth. Don't you think it's quite remarkable that this little fledgling place over here, these 13 colonies, after eight years of a knockdown, drag out fight, was able to declare its independence and win it from the, biggest, the greatest army in the world? and the greatest navy in the world, <coughs> that America was able to win its independence, almost thinks, makes you think that God had a hand in the establishing of this country, don't you think? Yeah. He certainly did, because he was going to use America 
as a missionary field. He was going to use it as a place to send missionaries to the ends of the world. He was going to use America as a place for the Great Awakening where he would show men and women what a real move of the Spirit of God was really like. And he was going to use America to establish it on a constitution that looked up into the heavens and said, the Lord God gives us our rights. And from that day on, America grew and America was great. The people we have in office today in America don't know anything about that. They don't believe in that. They're taking your rights and your freedoms away from you, left and right. I'm telling you right now, and please hear what I've got to say. This next election that's coming up may be the most important election that this nation has ever had. You've already seen what the Supreme Court has done. You've already, you've already seen the preview of what's coming. And, you've, and, 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 and you should be witness to that fact. And this next election coming up in the United States of America may very well be the most important election that this republic has ever had in its existence. So the slave trade flourished, but William Wilberforce fought it. He fought it because it was barbaric. He fought it, was, fought it because it was inhuman. He fought it because there was no way that he could reconcile the buying and selling of human beings with the gospel of the grace of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I say to you tonight, I can't either. I cannot justify the two. They are incompatible. They cannot belong in the same ship together. If I know my Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, I've been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, my sins have been forgiven, who am I? To take a man or a woman and enslave them and drive them and take their life and liberty and freedom away from them. The Bible said be kind-hearted, tender, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. The New Testament is full of admonitions for us to be good to each other and forgive each other and bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How in the world can that be compatible with the slave trade? So in 1807 they passed the law. And here's where the rub comes in. Great Britain not only passed a law in 1807 that said that the slave trade is illegal in Great Britain, they began to enforce that law in the Atlantic Ocean, especially of any ship that they might find that was a slave ship. They would stop that ship, board that ship, and whatever they needed to do to see to it that the law was enforced. And so Great Britain became the police of the seas. This ran them headlong into the United States of America. For there were times that they would board an American ship. And by boarding that American ship, it created a lot of tension between Great Britain and the United States of America, which along with other things eventually led to the second war, some call it, of independence. The first one was fought in 1776, but the second war of independence was in 1812. And this was a war between Great Britain and the United States, and part of the issue of that was boarding of American ships, and Great Britain was going to enforce the slave trade uh, prohibition and ban on the seas. Now, I'd say to, now I'm going to get, be honest with you tonight. The United States passed a sl an anti-slave trade bill in 1807 too. And so the United States uh, understanding that it was a lucrative business. You have families in this country right now, folks. Now, listen carefully to what I'm saying to you. There are millionaires in this country right now, right now, that are directly that are the direct result of the slave trade of the 1700s. Right. Amen. And you can be certain they don't want their name in public. You can be certain they're not going to tell you on Facebook about what all they were part of. You can be certain that they're going to stay in the, in the background as much as possible. But that is a fact of the, of, 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 of the history of this nation and the world. The reason I bring this up to you tonight is to tell you that the moving force, the moving force in Great Britain to eradicate the slave trade was by a Christian, an evangelical Christian. It was by a man who was born again. William Wilberforce was a little man. He wasn't huge, but he had a big heart, and he had a big love for his Savior. And so, therefore, it was Christianity. It was Christ and his cross that was directly involved in the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. Now during that period of time, right before, the 18, before 1807, a young man that was a brigand, he was a, he was a drunkard, he was a thief, he was a, he was a, a rebel rouser, he was a hellion, uh, he was, got on a slave ship and took off. And he, uh, and he, and he uh, almost lost his life one time in Africa. And, uh, and he got hardened through all of this. And, and when you're dealing firsthand with the slave trade, it can make you, no doubt, I don't see how you could get anything but hard 
to watch the suffering and the death of another human being like that. You have to harden yourself to it. That's all I can say. That's how you live. And he got hard. But he came face to face with mortality. And let me read to you what he said. These are his own words. He came face to face with mortality. And here's what he said. Uh, he said, that night, a violent storm flooded the ship with water. Fearing for his life, he surprised himself by uttering, Lord, have mercy on us. Spending long hours at the ship's, ship's helm, he reflected on his life and rejection of God. At first, he thought his shortcomings too great to be forgiven. Then he said, I began to think of Jesus, whom I had so often derided of his life and of his death for sins not his own, but for those who in their distress should put their trust in him. In coming days, the New Testament story of the prodigal son particularly impressed him. He became convinced of the truth of Jesus' message and his own need for it. I was no longer an atheist, he writes. There aren't many atheists in the foxholes, by the way. Atheists live in... in uh, they live in comfortable surroundings and they have good incomes and they're healthy. And, uh, he said, I was no longer an atheist. I was sincerely touched with a sense of undeserved mercy in being brought safe through so many dangers. I was a new man. And so he wrote a song. He wanted you to hear the words of what happened to him. And here are his words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be, as long as life endures. Yes, when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. John Newton, 1779. John Newton was moved by his association with William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce had an enormous effect on John Newton. And because of that, John Newton became part of the abolitionist movement in Great Britain once he got saved by the grace of God. John Newton got saved by the grace of God because he came face to face with his own mortality and realized for the first time in his life how sorry and low down and what a, what a miserable creep that he really was, and he was not ready for death. He was not ready for it. Now, let me tell you something tonight. This you can be certain of. 95% of the people that you rub shoulders with every day of your life are not ready to die. The last thing on their mind is death. So somehow or another they're in this stupor like a drunk man, like, like somebody doped up as if I keep putting it off and I keep putting it off and I don't think about it, I don't have to worry about it, it's not going to happen. And somehow or another they've convinced themselves that they're going to live forever. Even though they know it's a lie, they had rather believe the lie than believe the truth. But the truth is it is appointed to men once to die. And after this the judgment. So John Newton got saved. And we sing... We sing his song. It's become the Baptist theme song. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Oh, there's much more about John Newton. There's much more about William Wilberforce. Uh, when you get into these men, I mean, you could spend a whole night talking about their lives and what all that they, uh, what they accomplished. Here's a couple of quotes from John Newton. He said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
I say amen. Brother Newton, amen. John Newton had spiritual discernment. He really did. Here's what he said. Now listen carefully to this. He had great spiritual discernment. He said, self-righteousness can feed upon doctrines as well as upon works. Amen. Take that home and think about it. A Pharisee is a man who can quote you all of his law, all of his do's and all of his don'ts, but he only quotes and does that part that's comfortable to himself, that he can see himself accomplishing. Therefore, he builds his self-righteousness. Now, William Wilberforce, the Slave Act, Trade Act of 1807, he was the man that pushed it and got it through the Parliament in Great Britain. And because of that, uh, the slave trade was outlawed, uh, and Great Britain went out into the sea, into the Atlantic, and because of the fact that they had such a great navy, they went out there to enforce that slave trade. And some people got killed, and some things happened, and one thing led to another. And But the, the bottom line is, when I look back at that and I think about how that Great Britain had the greatest navy in the world at that time, all I can say is it must have been the hand of God. It must have been the hand of God that moved for them to do that. Say, say why is that, preacher? Well, the colonies had plenty of slaves, folks. There were plenty of slaves here in the Americas. All kinds of slaves in the Caribbean. All kinds of slaves that had been brought over here previous to that. But once you shut off the pipeline... Once you shut off the slave trade, it's just a matter of time before it begins to dry up. And of course, it consummated in a war that started April 12, 1861, here in the United States of America. Oh, uh, and one of the issues was over the ownership of slaves in this nation. We call it the Civil War. You see, slaves, owning slaves and slave trade is a, is, a, is a hard thing to bear for anybody. I've got some books in my office written by some of the, um, some of the men who are their apologists for slavery. Uh, these books were printed in the late 1800s, and I could name names tonight, but I'm not going to do that. But I've read, I've read their books. I've read their works. I've read their quotes of Scripture. I've read their justification for slavery, and uh, I don't buy it. I reject it. I take the place of William Wilberforce, folks. And you ought to think about that tonight. I take his place of rejecting slavery. Like I say again, there's not one word, not one place in the New Testament that commands you to make a slave out of a human being. Here's what makes a slave out of a man is when he rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And sin dominates him and puts him in chains. There are people today who will fight the issue of slavery. They'll debate with you about the issue of slavery, but they are more slaves themselves than anybody that's ever been in this country or anywhere in the world. Amen. They're slaves. They're slaves to sin. There's only one tonight that can make you free, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. William Wilberforce was a humble man. When he died, he had a little place picked out for them to lay his body at rest. But uh, the Parliament over there in Great Britain talked to his family and said, uh, uh, let us bury him in uh, Westminster, Westminster, uh, which is the, uh, it is the place of the, of the, of the, the all I can say is you, you'd have to go there. I've been there one time, been there one time. There, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's a church, but it's full of tombs of the kings and the queens of Great Britain, of the generals, the explorers, of all the great names of the greatest of, Israel, of, of Great Britain, they're buried here in this church. But along with them is this man of God, this humble servant of the Lord, William Wilberforce. It would be good for every American to know who he is. It would be good for every Christian for certain to know who that man is because you're going to meet him at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll meet William Wilberforce. Here's a couple of things that he said. He said, It is not the great end of religion and in particular the glory of Christianity to extinguish. Is it not the great end of religion and in particular the glory of Christianity 
to extinguish the malignant passions, to curb the violence, to control the appetites, and to smooth the aspirates of man, to make us compassionate and kind and forgiving one to another, to make us good husbands, good fathers, good friends, and to render us active and useful in the discharge of the relative social and civil duties. Amen. Did you know that if America had a real Christianity, our marriages would be healed? Our little children would have a mother and a father. Instead of an intellectual or a, 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 a cultural Christianity, if we had a real Christianity in this country, the man would be the wet breadwinner in the home, and the man would go stand and fight for his family, and he'd stand against the enemy, and he'd set the example before his children, and he would be willing to give his life for his home. Notice that it says, husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, you may not be too familiar tonight with some of the th things about the Hindu religion, but remember that Great Britain at one time was a world empire. Remember that during the time of Queen Victoria, which was later than Wilberforce, during her lifetime, the sun never set on the British Empire. That's how large it was. From sea to sea, the sun never set. Somewhere all the time in the world, a colony of Great Britain had the sun shining on it. Great Britain carried the standard of freedom, Christianity, planted the missionaries. Great Britain sent folks, many, many, many missionaries to the foreign field, especially in the 1800s carrying the word of God. Some of the finest Christians that's ever lived on this earth went out from Great Britain. India is particularly a vile country. India is connected with Hinduism. Hinduism came from Brahmism, Buddhism, then Hinduism, through that progression. It is a caste system. You're born into a certain life. You can't change your circumstances. You can't do a thing to change it. You're born into a country that is demon-possessed. There are demons everywhere. They worship demons. They've got millions of gods, the Hindu. And you're, you're, you're born into a country of ignorance. You're born into a country of, of vile superstition. Did you know that if a man dies in India, that they'll take his bride? If he's a young man, they'll take his young bride and they will burn her on the pyre that they burn his body on. That's called sati. That's part of the Indian culture. Now when Great Britain got over there and they, and they tried to preach the gospel to them and convert them to Christ, they stopped it officially, but it never really stopped. You see, you can, you can pass laws and stop something officially, but you're not going to change the people. Did you know that in India, it's one of the worst countries in the world for infanticide, the killing, of the, uh, the killing of the children, killing of little ones? Did you know that America has killed 70 million babies? Did you know that back in the time when the gospel of Christ was preached from sea to sea in America, and we had the great awakening and we had revivals that were real revivals, and men would, and, 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 and people in this country at one time would pray and read their Bible? We didn't have anybody killing people like that. We had abortions. We've always had abortions. Abortions have always been around from the creation of mankind. No question about that. But we weren't killing them like we are today. What's happened to America? It's turned into paganism. It's turned into a another India in a lot of senses. Wilberforce preached the gospel. He believed in getting people saved. He believed in changing them. And India, folks, is one horrible place. I don't know if you know anything about it. There's a place over there in Calcutta called the Black Hole. How many of you know how big Calcutta, India is? It would swallow the state of Tennessee three or four times as far as population is concerned. It's a huge place. And there's a place over there that's called the Black Hole in Calcutta. So what's that, preacher? It's a black dungeon. It's a place where you throw people and they never expect to come out and live again. It's where people that, are, that have leprosy and they have diseases and they have, they have, they have problems in the, with their bodies, they're, they're crippled and what have you, and they just can't make it, they get thrown in there. 
They, they kill people. It's a horrible place. There's no compassion. There's no grace. There's no forgiveness. You are what you are from the moment of birth, and that's the way you're going to die. You live out your karma. Aren't you glad for the gospel of the grace of God? Aren't you glad that you're here in the Bible Belt where the gospel of the grace of God is preached? Folks, we got people coming in here, and I can look at their face, and, and some of them are in distress. And they say, Preacher, ain't nobody preaching where we live. Nobody's preaching where we live. Oh, we got all kinds of feel-good churches, they say. We got all kinds of rock and roll churches, but nobody's preaching. I get emails all the time on the Internet, and they say, Preacher, you're our pastor. I don't know how many people, I'm the pastor, <laughs> scattered all over the place. It'd be, be, be hard to make house calls, all these people. From, if, if I don't show up, I'm in California <laughs> making a prayer house call with somebody, visiting the sick. <laughs> but you do the best you can. That's all I can do. That's all any of us can do. But we've lost something. Don't ever let them take it away from you, Temple. I may not always be with you. If the Lord doesn't come back, I may not always be here. I may get called home. I'm ready to go. I know whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. My body's failing. I'll be 70 years old next September. I know some of you are older than me, but I'm going to tell you something right now. I can tell the difference in my body. I get tired. I'm tired on Sunday night. I'm tired. I just get dog tired. I don't rest up as quickly as I used to. So, you know, that's what happens. That's the way of all the earth. That's the flesh. And so if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back, I won't always be here. I'll be gone, but I know where I'm going. If you happen to have a funeral service for me and you come down and they got my body down here in a casket or something, and you look down in that casket and see my body and say, well, we're going to take him out and we're going to bury him now. Sorry. I ain't in there. I'm gone. I'm gone. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know it would be a scary thing for some of you. But my greatest prayer request tonight would simply be this. And it's a simple prayer request. Lord, if you want to come and take me, take me and just kind of let me drop right here behind the pulpit. This would, this would be a good place to leave from. Right here. Right here. Where I'm doing what I'm called to do. Hey, I've already seen, if I never see outside again, I know who I have believed in. And I know he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. God pulled me out of the black hole. He came and got me and called my name and said, Son, there's daylight where I am. You can come out of that pit. And he brought me out and he saved me and he wrote my name in heaven and he gave me a ministry and he gave me a calling and he gave me far more than I ever deserved. And so I'm going to do this by the grace of God until I'm done. Don't ever worry about me retiring. If I ever get to the point to where I have to retire, I'm retired. I mean, I'm leaving. I have no desire to go somewhere and sit and rock. I have no desire to go somewhere out here and just and go off into the golden years. Who told you they were golden anyway? <laughs> They're brass, brother. <laughs> Nothing golden about them. <laughs> but I'm thankful. I'm thankful to God for what he's done for me. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I hope that little bit of history tonight, connected with Philemon, a runaway slave, is kind of instructive. Great Britain's not a perfect country. They've got their problems. They've had their problems. But God's used them in the past. He has used them. They were very instrumental in stopping that murderous slave trade in the oceans with their navy. Yes, sir. Brother. One in five end up in abortion. Yeah. Isn't that That's sad. I, I think all the time, you won't see little babies, folks, at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne. You won't see little babies. You're going to see fully grown, fully matured, 
And you're going to think to yourself, my goodness gracious, these were the ones that were murdered. They were killed. They were offered on the, on the altar of convenience, sacrificed to Moloch in this country and around the world. Folks, they're real. They'll be there. You're going to have to deal with them. And the only way to have it right is to get on your face and say, God, forgive me for killing my baby. Lord God, get its blood off of my hands. Forgive me if I was party to an abortion. God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for having part to do with that. And he will. He will. He will. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes. Absolutely. Without that comfort, I don't know how that any of us survive in this vile world that you're yeah. trying yeah. to live with yeah. tonight, man. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, 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 stories like that do me so much better than to hear about 70 million lives. Can you imagine, though, that maybe one day Ephraim will meet them in heaven yeah. and say, I'm glad you let me breathe. Yes. Yes, sir. However long it will. Yes, sir. Yeah. They'll meet that child. Yeah. And he's safe in the arms of Jesus. Yes. Safe. All right, let's stand up tonight. God bless you. Thank you for listening to me. <clears throat> yes, ma'am.
Yes, ma'am. Amen. Oh, I've never heard her mom. Amen. Yes. Yes, sir. Doctor said that. Amen. Doctor learned a lesson. Sure did. And we don't know exactly. He might have been right on his diagnosis, but the Almighty intervened. That's right. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. Y'all remember Shelly Lee tonight? She sent me a text message right before I came to church, and she said she has an infection in both ears and has a lot of pain with it, and then asked it that I would uh, request prayer for her. Shelly Lee. Remember Roger, he's pastoring a church now up in uh, Jacksboro, I think it's Jacksboro, somewhere up in there. Remember Roger, Roger Lee's a good man, folks. Amen. Roger Lee's a good man. And pray for him and pray for the church that he's pastoring up there and ask the good Lord bless him and give him the messages he needs to preach and minister to those people. Amen. All right. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Amen. All right. All right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy Maples. All right. Amen. Okay. All right. Amen. Yes, sir. Michelle West, I talked to Gary West a few, well, probably two or three weeks ago on the phone, and she's down in Chattanooga with her mother, and uh, apparently nothing, she hasn't, uh, I mean, he's not saying that she's gotten a lot worse from my, I understood from him that she's not doing, she's not great, but she's, I guess, about the same she has been, and, uh, and Gary West needs our prayer, too, he's been, he's, he's a sick man, and he's, uh, he's had to stay there with his wife a lot lately. And uh, please pray for him. Gary West is a good man. He needs, he needs prayer. Please lift him up for the Lord. Amen. Sometimes things get hard, folks. And life can get hard. And you need your brothers and sisters to come to help you and come to your aid. Yes, sir. Yes. That ALS, ALS, I've been through two people here at Temple with ALS, and it's a, it's a degenerating thing. Please pray for that family. Yes, ma'am. Bless you. It's been good to be here today. It's 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 been good to be up on the mountain. Lord, let's, let's build a tabernacle up here. <laughs> Three of them, brother. Yeah. Lord had to straighten them up, didn't he? All right. God bless you. It's good to have Brother Barry back with us tonight. Amen. And uh, they said you've been having some headaches and stuff down there in Haiti. All right. You've been doing a little better. Well, good. Good. Will you will you dismiss us, please?
Amen. Amen.